Okay, thank you, Caroline. And now we come to Audrey Murfin, who is Associate Professor of English at S South yeah, Houston, Sam, Sam South Houston, Houston yeah. State yeah. University in Texas. <laughs> She's author of Robert Louis Stevenson and the Art of Collaboration, published by Edinburgh University Press. And this afternoon, she's going to talk to us about pleasure for profit, opium, and that fascinating, sprawling novel, The Wrecker. In Robert Louis Stevenson's and Lloyd Osborne's 1892 novel, The Wrecker, Ludon Dodd and his business partner, Jim Pinkerton, conspire to buy at auction a wrecked ship, the Flying Scud, off the coast of Midway Island, hypothesizing that the ship, which is carrying, quote, rice, silks, teas, and China notions, will in fact be full of opium, which they intend to sell at a profit. Sadly for them, the opium they find amounts to only a fraction of their total investment, and the second half of the novel explores the mystery of why a relatively worthless ship was being auctioned at such high prices in the first place. However, despite the novel's foregrounding of opium, the intoxicating nature of the drug is absent from the wrecker. Opium's significance is exclusively represented through its exchange value, which is $20 a pound in San Francisco, but 40 in Honolulu, Dodd tells us. Dodd and Pinkerton are addicted to a darker substance, money. In earlier travel writing, Stevenson had taken on the opium dens of San Francisco and the related problem of the racist Yellow Peril media campaign that sought to smear Chinese Americans with the blame for opium addiction in the United States. In the wrecker, Stevenson moves beyond the racial construction of blame and instead shifts to an economic formation of social ills. The wrecker asks us to reconsider the blame for opium addiction. Opium's mysterious pleasures are supplanted by its role in the global economy. By looking at Stevenson's treatment of opium and trade in the wrecker, this paper will examine the relationship between intoxication, pleasure, and cash. So uh, again, for a novel about opium, there's very little use of the substance in the wrecker, uh, very little use of it in the wrecker. In fact, there's only one instance of a character being known to use opium, which is that when Dodd and crew reach the Flying Scud and are searching it for the drug, they find a small opium pipe along with a personal stash in a bag that belonged to the ship's former cook, Ah Wing. So aside from this one small detail, the use of opium is absent from the text, uh, which contrasts sharply with another substance, alcohol, which figures prominently by contrast as both a used substance and also an investment opportunity. Um, the characters in the novel have a fake French brandy business, but they also drink quite a lot. Uh, so investment in opium follows as a natural conclusion from their investment in alcohol, but where Dodd and Pinkerton both profit and partake when the substance is alcohol, when it's opium, they do not get high on their own supply. But it is in the excitement of bidding on the wreck itself that Dodd and Pinkerton become inebriated with the love of money. In the descriptions of their business dealings, money itself is des described as a kind of intoxicant. Uh, as the men lose their wits in the excitement of bidding up the wreck of the flying scud. Uh, Dodd says, by this time neither Pinkerton nor I were of sound mind. Pinkerton was beside himself, his eyes like lamps. I shook in every member. Opium's pleasures and dangers alike evaporate in contrast with the delights of capital. Dodd describes the excitement and allure of Pinkerton's early business ventures. Every dollar gained was like something brought ashore from a mysterious deep. Every venture made was like a diver's plunge, and as he thrust his bold hand into the plexus of the money market, he was delightedly aware of how he shook the pillars of existence, turned out men as at a battle cry to labor in far countries, 
and set the gold twitching in the drawers of millionaires. Philip Steer has argued that the wrecker and the ebb tide, I quote, represent a concerted attempt to describe the workings of an emerging form of imperial expansion driven more by multinational forms of financial speculation than national political interests. Increasingly, I argue that Stevenson was becoming aware of the fiction of national stereotypes and interests compared to global capitalism, a fiction that in the case of opium was especially pertinent during the period. While the Chinese were stereotypically associated with the drug, it was actually a pair of Scotsmen from Edinburgh, uh, William Hardeen and James Matheson, who had stood to profit the most earlier in the century. I just kind of, I haven't looked into this much, but I feel like that would not have escaped Stevenson's notice. So if you know anything about it, let me know. What are we then to make of a novel about opium smuggling and how sympathetic as readers are we to remain to a protagonist who is a smuggler? Because Lou Don Don is, I mean, he is the protagonist. Dodd himself reflects on the enormity of his crime within the novel. He says, it shows how much I had suffered morally during my sojourn in San Francisco, that even now, when our fortunes trembled in the balance, I should have consented to become a smuggler, and of all things, a smuggler of opium. Yet I did, and that in silence, without a protest, not without a twinge. Even more directly, he states that smuggling is one of the meanest of crimes, for by that we rob a whole country pro rata, and are therefore certain to impoverish the poor. To smuggle opium is an offense particularly dark, since it stands related not so much to murder as to massacre. But none of this stops him. And in fact, later in the novel, when Dobb begins to have scruples about his behavior, Captain Nares chides him and says, you went into opium smuggling with your head down and a good deal of fussing I've listened to that you hadn't more of it to smuggle. Though Dodd acknowledges the societal evils created by opium, he never reflects on the ultimate consumers of the product. Dodd, and thus the very perspective of the novel itself, are intellectually aware but morally blind to smuggling's consequence. While Stevenson has Dodd express these moral reservations, at no point does the novel at itself ask us to turn away from Dodd as a protagonist. Uh, Dodd, in fact, was based on Stevenson's friend, the artist Will H. Lowe, who was apparently not troubled to be represented as a drug smuggler. Yes, Dodd has scruples about his crimes, but in the novel's dark description of the global market, such scruples cannot be sustained. Opium's pleasures and dangers alike evaporate in contrast to the delights of capital. However, while Steer says that in the wrecker, the Pacific setting merely foregrounds trade and speculation among Americans and Europeans, this misses China as an important third term. Uh, the wrecker alone of Stevenson's fiction concerns itself with the Chinese presence in the Pacific. And while there are numerous mentions throughout the novel of Chinese ships and Chinese articles for trade, still more of China's presence is inflected through San Francisco's Chinatown which both Dodd and Stevenson himself had visited and described, and where concerns about Chinese immigration and about opium abuse were high and interrelated. The popular American media treatment of opium at the end of the century demonized the Chinese for the drug's addictive nature. William Randolph Hearst's tabloid campaign of the Yellow Peril stoked fears of Chinese immigration by playing upon the threat that Chinese men were addicting white women to the drug. Following on Hearst's propaganda, the expectation that authors or journalists writing on San Francisco would include a segment on opium dens in Chinatown was such that, according to Jeff Goldberg, a set piece description of opium smoking was a requirement for every cub reporter on every territorial gazette covering San Francisco. Stevenson himself participated in this in his essay, San Francisco, which was originally published in 1883 and re reprinted with its companion essay, Monterey, under the title, The Old and New Pacific Capitals, sometimes attached to Across the Plains. 
When Ludon Dodd visits San Francisco, Stevenson drew on his own descriptions of the city and its diversity from that essay, San Francisco. Uh, Stevenson reflects with wonder the mingling of races that combined the people of the city, and in particular, the ways in which the different immigrants have made their own neighborhoods and communities. Uh, he talks about the Italian neighborhood with the Italian caricatures in the window, Chianti and Polenta in the taverns, before moving on to his description of Chinatown, which, and this is the quote where you'll see it echoed in the novel, has, quote, outlandish vegetables, misshapen, lean, or bulbous, and also the lines of a hundred telegraphs pass thick as ships rigging overhead, a kite hanging among them. In the wrecker, when Dodd, so Dodd describes the exact same geographical transition from Little Italy to Chinatown, uh, and I think the Little Mexico is in there too, and the high class neighborhood of Knob Hill. Um, Stevenson even has Dodd enjoy the same Chianti that Stevenson enjoyed in his essay. Um, so here's uh, Ludon Dodd on it. Uh, Little Italy was a haunt of mine. There I would look in at the windows of small eating shops transported bodily from Genoa or Naples with their macaroni and Chianti flasks and portraits of Garibaldi and colored political caricatures. I'll skip over the Mexican section. Chinatown by a thousand eccentricities drew and held me. I could never have enough of its ambiguous interracial atmosphere as of a vitalized museum. Never wonder enough at its outlandish necromantic looking vegetables set forth to sell in commonplace American shop windows, its temple doors open, and the scent of the jaw stick streaming forth on the American air, its kites of oriental fashion, hanging fouled in western telegraph wires, its flights of paper prayers which the trade wind hunts and dissipates along western gutters. Uh, and, um, and yet, uh, missing from the wrecker's description of Chinatown is the dark picture of the opium dens that Stevenson describes in his essay, San Francisco, because Ludon Dodd's description stops there, but in Stevenson's own uh, d experience, he continues to, under to imagine this underground hall of horrors. He says, below you hear the cellars are alive with mystery, opium dens where the smokers lie one above another, shelf above shelf, close packed and groveling in deadly stupor, the seats of unknown vices and cruelties, the prisons of unacknowledged slaves, and the secret lazarettos of disease. With so much of the description of Chinatown in the wrecker coming from this essay, San Francisco, one wonders why Stevenson chose to remove his descriptions of the opium dens. Would the reader be unable to maintain sympathy with Dodd if the consequences of his smuggling were so vividly depicted? And yet, where journalistic common practice was to depict the opium problem as a Chinese problem, Stevenson seems to resist this. He had previously addressed the topic of anti-Chinese racism in the United States. In his essay, Across the Plains, from 1883, describing his train journey from New York to San Francisco, he observed the better hygiene in the Chinese compartment, which caused him to reflect poorly on the bigotry and stench of white Americans. He says, of all stupid ill feelings, the sentiment of my fellow Caucasians towards our companions in the Chinese car was the most stupid and the worst. That's more stupid, that's been a lot of stupid, right? Um, they seem that, but I think he means something different than the other uses maybe. Uh, they seem never to have looked at them, listened to them, or thought of them, but hated them a priori. To be fair, Stevenson's defense of the Chinese immigrants draws on many Orientalist stereotypes that we now find obnoxious. He says they have such a baggage of old Asiatic thoughts and superstitions as might check the locomotive in its course. But as to the cause of the white Americans' hatred, Stevenson observes, the Mongols could work better and cheaper in half a hundred industries, and hence there was no calumny for, too idle for the Caucasians to repeat and even believe. Uh, in fact, the addiction of Chinese laborers in San Francisco to opium was inseparable from the labor abuses under which they suffered. Popular historian Martin Booth describes 
how opium addiction went hand in hand with the so-called coolie trade in Chinese laborers. The drug suppressed, this is, um, uh, this is quoting from Booth, suppressed homesickness and the physical pain of laboring. And in some cases, opium was even cited as an incentive to emigrate because it was legal in many places outside China, whilst employers were reluctant to stamp out opium smoking for they feared without it they might suffer a labor shortage. This was the case in San Francisco where opium was illegal in the rest of the city but remained legal in Chinatowns where presumably the employers of Chinese immigrants wished to have it remain so. Uh, Booth dis details how 30,000 Chinese left Hong Kong for San Francisco alone. Tens of thousands flocked to the western seaboard to work predominantly as laborers on the railroads and in the mines. <clears throat> Many headed for the gold fields, mostly indentured. They were racially abused, cheated of their earnings, and considered of little importance. And by the way, I, I just, I haven't worked it in quite, but I've been really fascinated that one of my favorite his Stevenson-related historical figures is Ah Fu, who himself was Stevenson's cook uh, on board the ship, uh, and he had himself been ab abducted as a child as part of the coolie trade, so I wonder how much Stevenson is thinking about him as well. But the people that Booth describes are the very people that Stevenson had seen on the train years earlier and described in Across the Plains. So the relationship between racial constructions and literature is complex in that literature may be that which perpetuates stereotypes or that which arrests them. In the United States, the association of Chinese laborers with opium addiction was factually correct in that high numbers of these laborers were addicted to the drug. It was also ideologically motivated because it provided a politically convenient means to further ghettoize a despised underclass of American workers. Fictional and non-fiction travel narratives both have the capacity to reinscribe or to challenge these racist narratives. American media blamed the Chinese for opium problems in American cities, and this blame was pervasive enough to extend beyond the tabloids and into travel journalism of the, of the American West. To the extent that this association was used to foment anti-Chinese racism, Stevenson opposed it. Uh, in Stevenson's writings on San Francisco, we, we see him indulging in the moral hand-wringing over the opium dens in the city, characteristic of journalistic writing in the region. However, in the wrecker, uh, by, by placing the business in uh, uh, Ludon Dodd, who's Scottish-American, and, and um, Jim Pinkerton, who's an American, uh, Stevenson plainly dissociates the use or trade of opium from the Chinese uh, in a way that goes even beyond Stevenson's condemnation of anti-Chinese -China, racism in Across the Plains, the wrecker demonstrates how the opium trade, and by extension, the stereotypical association of the Chinese with this trade was in fact driven by American and European financial speculation. Thank you.